Hello and welcome to The Cutting Room, a YouTube channel of fire, blood and movie analysis from all the right movies. I'm John and with me today it's our very own war boys, Matt. Hello. And Westy. Hello. This is part two of our analysis of Mad Max Fury Road where we get into the writing and the cast. If you've not seen part one, it is available here. For now though, it's on with the writing. The screenplay for Mad Max Fury Road was written by George Miller, Brendan McCarthy and Nicola Tourist. Miller we just talked about, and Brendan McCarthy is a British artist most known for illustrating some classic comic books like Judge Dredd. Yes. And yeah. Nicola Tourist is an Australian most known for his acting. Not exactly a dream team of screenwriters then, mm, but no. how did they all come together on the Fury Road? Matt? Really well, actually, because it's not written in the way that we would normally talk about it, because it's such a visual film. And I say so much of it just in Miller's head that it was basically one long storyboard from start to finish. And it, yeah. it took him over 3,000 panels to get it all there. Hmm. He basically took yeah. off like an entire floor of the production office of it from start to finish. <laughs> so the screenplay was there for the actors, but it's extremely basic because it is all about the chase and it's all about the action. And that's just what Miller envisaged. And yet, despite that, it still works because I think there's some strong character work going on there. You know, Max's transformation from a selfish loner to a reluctant hero figure, that's tried and tested, but it works. Fury also gets a proper arc. She's on the run trying to protect these five women, but then she ends up being leader to an entire tribe of people. So that works fine. But what I really like about the writing is the dialogue actually because what I like about it is how it shows the transformation of our language into something that's just a little bit different so like there's two examples yeah. that stand out for me first one is when Nook says if I'm gonna die I'm gonna die historic on the Fury Road which yeah, Fury Road. yeah it's a great and you understand what he means but the like the grammar behind it is quite different to how we would say mm -hmm. that and then you get the scene later on when he's having like that screaming argument with Anna Harrod one of the wives and she yells at him and who killed which is a great way of like yeah. summing up the, the position they're in. So I really like what yeah. they do with the language. It like it helps with the world building and it pulls you into yeah. it. Mm. Tell me you're a subtitler for television, <laughs> bringing up the grammar. <laughs> oh, totally, <laughs> no one else yeah. has noticed that until now. Yeah. I was like blown away. I was like, shit, yeah, I didn't realise that. <laughs> yeah. I, can't, I can't switch off. Yeah, that's totally why. Yeah, you can't. <laughs> can't. Uh, they drop in some, like, I think, Australian colloquialisms as well, don't they? Like, schlanger. Yeah, schlanger. Yeah, yeah, quite a bit. Schlanger. Schlanger. Yeah, Australians, yeah. they love a crazy worthy Aussies, yeah. don't they? They can't pull frogs. That's an odd name. Oughta call them Chaz Wazzers. Yeah, so I love all that. And then in terms of plot, I mean, I think it's fair to say Miller was never really <laughs> interested in this film as being particularly plot driven. And I suppose it is a bit ridiculous that they leave point A, they get to point B, and then they decide, well, we'll just go back to point A then. I suggest we go back the same way we came. So, right, you know, yeah, which yeah. is kind of ridiculous, but it's the least important part of the film. So in terms of writing, no, it's not normally what we look at or how we judge a screenplay. But for what it is, I think it's really strong and it's very deliberate the way that it's been written. Yeah, I think as action films go, the writing here is top tier for an action film. I mean, the narrative is simple, but it's strong. Mm -hmm. It's all told logically. It all makes perfect sense. The main characters in Max, Furiosa and Nux are all well drawn out. Their yep. motivations are crystal clear at all times. Mm -hmm. And all three of them have strong arcs as well. Yep. The world is thought through to the point where it gives us subtext and themes. I like how the war boys have their own religion. They have their own sayings yeah. and the mm -hmm. hand symbol they make. And Immort and Joe uses their religion to manipulate them. Yep. And Joe himself holding the water from the masses, a critique of capitalism, surely. Yeah. And yeah. there's a very clear theme around feminism as well, where Joe calls his wives his property. Mm. Of all the good guys in the film, Max is the only man, and it's being around women that turns Nux into a good guy. Yeah. So there's actually quite a lot going on, I yeah. think. And the film is relentless action. So of those things I've just mentioned, they must do all of that in less than an hour of screen time, maybe less. Yeah. Mm. I think it would be really, really easy to overlook the writing in this film because of the action. But I think it's excellent, really good. Mm. The, the great thing about the writing in this, like you touched on there, John, it's like you see Max become a father figure, Nux become a son, they become mothers. It all kind of works on that level and it doesn't really need to be there. It's mm. just good enough as it is. And when you put that in, it just makes it even better. It is literally a storyboard. It's a, it's a, like watching a comic book, flicking through the pages yeah. as mm. fast as you possibly can. Yeah. And the writing, to be honest... I've seen it so many times where the writing lets down the action. The writing in this film actually gives it a leg up. Mm, it yeah. helps the action yeah. and it moves it forward. And for that reason, it's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. 
So the writing of Mad Max Fury Road then, as action films go, we think it's really good. Mm -hmm. Yes, really it good. is. Yep. There's a fairly wide cast in Fury Road, and we're going to pick out our favourites now. So, Westy, who are you going for? Yeah. I'm going to go for the main man himself, Tom Hardy as Max, mm. okay. whatever his last name is. Kaczynski, <laughs> Dansky, <laughs> whatever. Um, unnecessarily long last name for Max. Just leave it as Max. Brilliant. Um, but no, I think he's fantastic in the role. I think he's really, really good. But there are times where you see that he's a little bit lost. It doesn't quite know what's going on. Mm. But the genius of that is it really works for the character. Mm -hmm. Like Miller knows that that works for the character because he's lost. He doesn't know where he's going. <laughs> he doesn't know what time it is. They've stole his jacket. They've stole his car. That's mine. And he's just like, oh, I just want to get away. I just want some water and I just want to get away and get some petrol. And just that's it. Yeah. It's all he wants to do. And now he's stuck in this environment and he has to kind of solve problems and help people with things. And he doesn't necessarily want to do it. And to me, this is not a continuation of the Mel Gibson character. I don't feel it is. Mm. And a lot of people said it was the kid from Road Warrior who had the mm. music box. Right. And it was yeah. that kid, you know, grown up. And that was who Max was now. But Miller kind of crushed that and said, no, this is actually, you know, it, it's a continuation of the Mad Max character. Mm. But for me, it's just a continuation of the Mad Max ethos in this world. You know, the Mad Max outlook in this world. He suffered losses and it's in a graphic novel where you see all the, the backstory where the young kid and the mom dies. And you just kind of relate that back to the first Mad Max, but actually it's a different one. But there's just nuances by Hardy here, just little bits. That little thumb up yeah. out the window is genius. Yeah. Yeah. I do that every time I'm on the slip road going on the N90. <laughs> <laughs> Internal traffic, right? Cheers. <laughs> yeah, every single time. But it's fantastic. It's just when he's putting the hose in his mouth and he's just getting that water, you just go, you, you, it's just, he makes it really believable. Mm -hmm. That's my jacket. Yeah. Puts it on yeah. and it fits. But it's jacket from Road Warrior. A real assault, like a real punch, like a real weight, like, bah, like, yes, it's Tom Hardy. Every time you see him in the action sequences, you think, that's totally believable. He's doing it himself, and it's totally believable, 100%. I think he's absolutely fantastic as Mad Max. If you're going to bring Mad Max back now, yeah, it's got to be Tom Hardy. I don't think anyone else could have done it. Yeah, I think the biggest compliment I could give Tom Hardy for this is that when I watch it, I don't miss Mel Gibson in the lead at all. No, I no, mean, no. A lot of people wouldn't miss Mel Gibson for various reasons. <laughs> but, well, that's fair yeah. enough. <laughs> but I mean, he is a real movie star, Mel Gibson, loads of charisma. And at this point, he was definitively Mad Max. Yeah. So big shoes for anyone coming into Phil. And it did take a while for Miller to find his man. I mean, there was a couple yeah. of others in the frame as well. Have you heard any other names? I think there's oh, Jeremy Renner him. in the running at one point. You wanted well, to be. Well, Chine Tatum was one person up for it. Yes. Okay. Yeah, Michael right. Bean in the earlier days, back in the right. 80s, he was considered. Okay. And Eric Banner, yeah. what possibilities? Right. right. Miller actually. Like 87 did... when he wrote this, right? Yeah, going back as far yeah. as that when he had yeah. the idea, yeah. yeah. So Miller actually did want his ledger before he died in 2008. Mm. And Jeremy Renner actively campaigned to get the role. Right. I mean, Ledger, yes. Renner, definitely not. No. <laughs> no way. I don't know. He's massive in the hurt lock, although he is brilliant in that. He is. Oh, I like him. I like him as Hawkeye as well, but mm. he's always a support character in those. Yeah. Coming in here as the main guy, I'm not so sure. I don't know. I don't know. You know, I think he, I, I don't know. I think he might have been good. I think he might have been yeah. really, really good. Fair enough. It just, it may, maybe just like a, a little bit more of a vulnerable version. Mm. He, doesn't have, he hasn't got the strength of Hardy, but maybe that vulnerable version. But I can see him pulling off this role. Yeah. If you watch a hurt like that, he's massive in yeah, that. Yeah, he is good in that. I think I, he could have done it. He could have done it. I think he could have done it. But I'm happy it's hard. Yeah. Matt, what about you then in the cast? Who do you want to talk about? I want to talk about Shalise Theron. I mean, I think just in general, Very nice. I think she's an incredible actress. She can do anything. Yes. Look at her filmography. You put her in a comedy like Longshot, she's hilarious. She can do really yes. dark, dramatic stuff like Monsters. She can do edgy stuff like Young Adult. And then put her in an action film like Atomic Blonde from a few years ago, and she just kicks yeah. ass in that. And then you've got this. And here, I think she's just something else. And the interesting thing is Max has his name in the title, but this is Furiosa's film. It's her character who has the proper arc. Her character has the emotional journey. And if you're going to do that, if you're going to make a film that has someone's name in the title but make it about someone else, then you've got to really justify that with a proper character and a proper performance. And I think that's where you get from Thrawn. And the first thing that really strikes me about her performance here is the complete lack of ego that she has. I mean, she's yeah. a stunningly beautiful woman, and yet she's got no problem shaving her hair for this, which was her idea, by Twice. the way. Twice, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Um, 
the original plan was for a few years to have like dreadlocks, but she said to George Miller, said, that doesn't make sense. She's a mechanic. She's a fighter. That hair would just get in the way. It's too easy for people mm. to like grab hold of and fight. Let me shave my head. And she did. It's fantastic. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And then as well as that, also, you know, her character only has one arm as well. So she's got absolutely no ego about looking beautiful in the film. You know, make me look as messed up as you want. It's just absolutely fine. That. I think that's fantastic. And yeah, yeah th there are other actresses who've done similar. Obviously, you think Sigourney Weaver, Alien 3 is a big one. But none of them did what Theron did, which is do that while filming out in the middle of the desert, miles from anywhere, having to deal with shit from Tom Hardy on a daily basis. And that's what Theron put up with. And all that toughness filters into the performance. And I think she became as much of a leader on set as she is a leader in the film. And the other thing yeah. about her performance is that despite all this, she doesn't lose her femininity by taking on this huge action role, which is why I think people do hold this up as being a great feminist action movie, because she doesn't have to become masculine to, to take on this role. Mm -hmm. She's still very feminine, but it's never seen as a weakness. So you have that amazing scene where she gets to the green place, but finds out it's gone. That whole thing she was pinning all her hopes on is gone oh, yeah. and she has that emotional breakdown in the desert. Mm. And again, that was her idea. She went up to George Miller and said, look, we need a moment where she's completely lost because she's been so tough so far. We need this moment. Just roll the camera and let me do something. And that's what she gave him. And it's a really heartbreaking wow. moment, but it's not weak. And that's so key to her character and her performance. She's tough. But she's not invulnerable, she's brave, but she's not masculine. But then in turn, that doesn't make her weak. I think it's a really, really well thought through, really intelligent, wonderful performance. I think she's just fantastic in this. Nice. I agree. I think she's superb. She steals the film mm -hmm. for me. Yeah. Totally steals the film. Should be called Furiosa, Fury Road. Yeah, sure. Also, apparently. <laughs> Yeah. Charlie Theron and Tom Hardy didn't get on apparently at all mm. during the filming. Yeah. There's a behind the scenes book called Blood, Sweat and Chrome, The Wild and True Story of Mad Max Fury Road by yeah. Kelly Buchanan. And apparently Tom Hardy would regularly turn up to film scenes like hours late. Yeah. And after a while, Theron like exploded on the set and ran that item in front of everybody. And if you if you're watching Charlie's, then Matt would pretty much like to marry it, I think. Well, you know, <laughs> if you want to if hook that up. <laughs> when turn it down, yeah. You know. Everyone saw that out. Let, let's make that happen. <laughs> when you're Marry Max. Marry Max. There we go. Marry Max Fury Road. <laughs> <Rue. laughs> well, Max and Furiosa are the two main characters in the film, obviously, but there's a whole range of colourful, shall we say, supporting mm, characters yeah. as well. Fantastic. Nicholas, yeah, Nicholas Holt is Nook, deserves a mention. He has a fantastic yes, arc yeah. and a great death scene. The five wives are all good, mm. and the likes of yes. Rictus Erectus, the people eater, Corpus Colossus, and the Bullet Farmer are <laughs> mental. Yeah, totally mental. Farmer. You do a whole film on the Bullet Farmer. <laughs> Pulling his teeth out for load his gun. Genius. Honestly, what? <laughs> what when the he's, fuck? Yeah, when he's yeah. just screaming to himself with his arms in the air. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, insane. <laughs> so here we are, favourite supporting characters in the film, Westy. My favourite supporting character in the film is obviously the Doof Warrior. <laughs> of course he because is. That is my dream job. <laughs> <laughs> Westing up there, wear your mum's face as a mask and play the Zeppelin riffs. Fucking <laughs> yes, yes, man. And what what do you want to do? Oh, uh, can you put fire out the end of the guitar as well? Same. Yeah, of course you can. <laughs> yes, I've tried to do that. I just love the guy. I love that the fact that they created that backstory. I love the fact that there's a lot to that character. But I love it in the sound design. When you hear them getting close mm, and you see that, yeah. I love that. <laughs> yeah. And it's just there and you're just like, oh, yes. Yeah. That's why I love that kind of music. Like, it's really doom metal. It's really goth. It's really miserable. But at the same time, really kind of punch the air. And the first time I saw that, when they just ride out yeah. after them and you just see him and he's like having the best time. <laughs> and he's just, I was yeah. just like, yes. I stood up and said, I was like, yes, that's it. <laughs> That's what, I'm, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Amazing. What is he not got his own film? That's how good the writing is and the direction of George Miller this film. I was like, that right there is what I want to do with the rest of my life. And I'm never going to be able to do it unless someone drops nuclear warheads and I survive. And that's what I'm going to do. But yeah, that is my favourite character. Probably my favourite character of the last 10 years that I've seen. 
<laughs> and a supporting character that has no dialogue whatsoever gets smacked off Hardy and still kind of goes for it. That, it there's nothing better for me. I'd absolutely love that guy. He would be my best friend, and I'll play drums for him. <laughs> he, is me- he is mental. Yeah. You touched on there, Westy, and George Miller did actually write out a full backstory for the Doof Warrior. They both did. The guy who made it brought up the face as his mom. Right. Like, he put that in there. Which is outrageously it dark. Is crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. <brilliant. laughs> yeah, so the idea was that the two four was blind from birth and he and his yeah. mother lived in a mining town and when things started going a bit crazy, some people went to live in the mining shaft right. and he went with yeah. them. And that's when he lost his eyesight, so you can't see in a mine. So he took a plane the guitar, and as a result, he went blind when he left the mine like a pit pony. And right. the doof was taken in by Immortan Joe after he found him cradling his dead mother. And the mask, like you say, is made from his mother's face. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Just insane. <laughs> <laughs> and Matt, who's your favourite of the supporting cast? Yeah. It, it's a bit of a cheat, but I'm going to say the Vuvalini in general, who were the tribal women in the nice. green place, because... I think once they get to there and they find that it's gone, this tribe of women then become just really important to the story because they're not battle-hardened in the way that few yours is, but they're also not these young, beautiful brides like those characters are. They're just very normal, and quite a lot of them are pretty old. But what's important to me is I want Max and Furiosa to decide that actually they're just going to turn around, smash through with Martin Joe's forces and take the Citadel. The Vuvalini is straight into the fight with them. You know, one of them is a weak link, so you've got the Valkyrie, who's taken out Joe's forces with her shotgun before she gets run over, which is a really gutting moment. And yeah. that actress, Megan Gale, she was actually going to play Wonder Woman for George Miller if he was going to do Justice League. Oh, wow. Yeah, so that's why she's now, so he, he was going to cast her as Wonder Woman, and I think she's great. Um, I really like mm-hmm. the old lady who's called the Keep of the Seeds, and she gets stuck oh, into the fight, great. despite being all pretty ancient yeah. when the poor cats are trying to drag the brides out and she's grabbing them back. They're all just getting stuck in. It's They're, they're a great set of characters. It, it's not the one who dies with a smile on yeah. her face, which yeah, is yeah, really yeah. beautiful. D- yeah, it's just when she takes the bag yeah, off her. Yeah, yeah, just propped up in the seat. Because the best thing is they're not bystanders. They're not there to be looked after by Max and Furious and to be rescued. They're just right into the thick of it. I think it's a fantastic group of characters. So, yeah. It's that heartbreaking moment where she shoots at a Morton Joe yeah. and just hits the windscreen yeah. and ducks under yeah, the yeah. car and you're like, fuck yeah, hell. Out. But then she gets run over yeah, anyway. Yeah. It's, yeah. Oh, yeah. it's such a heartbreaker. Yeah, yeah. I like uh, Melissa Jaffa, who plays the keeper of the CD you mentioned there. Yeah. She yeah. was... 78 when they did the film she did yeah. some of her own stunts as well yeah. and she used to be in a science fiction series called Farscape which was really good in that I am the woman you are the man so we've not mentioned the big bad yet no that's Immortan Joe mm. played by Hugh Keithburn and that's yes. because we have a Patreon question on him so Peter Sutcliffe not that one is here to ask his question Hi lads it's Peter here my question for Mad Max Fury Road is where would you rank him Martin Joe among the pantheon of film villains? Cheers. Good question from Peter. Mm-hmm. What yeah. do you think, Matt? Oh, I'd, I'd definitely put him in the Valhalla of great villains of Martin Joe. I <laughs> think he's just <laughs> fantastic. Nice. Yeah. And, you, and you need someone who, considering this is a, a chase movie, you don't have the face off that you would normally get between a villain and the hero. You don't have the showdown between them. Yeah. So he, he's got to carry that threat despite being separate from Max and Furiosa for so much of the film. And that's why you get because he's so physically imposing, despite the fact that, you know, he's quite fucked up. He's covered in sores and he obviously has breathing issues. He's like a really, really yeah. messed up ve- version of Darth Vader, basically. But you do get the literal face off with Furiosa, though. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Right at the end, yes, that's true. Literal face <laughs> really off. Literal. 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 Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's fantastic. <laughs> Remember me. But it, it's because he, he's more than a physical f- threat, though. You, you've kind of mentioned it already, John, but it's how he manipulates everyone around him. So the crowd that gather below the Citadel for the water, he gives them just enough to live, but not enough to flourish. Yeah. And he tells them, don't get addicted to it. You know, don't do that. I control it. Don't get addicted. He has the war boys hanging on his every word. So he's not just a thug. He's intelligent, and I think that makes him even more dangerous. Uh, so, yeah, I think he's a fantastic villain. Yeah. Really, really, really good. I agree. Played by Hugh Keithburn, who was in the original Mad Max in 1979 mm, yes. as Toe Cutter. Yep. And mm. he's really good here as well as Joe. Absolutely disgusting when he's getting squeezed into that oh, suit at the start yeah. with boils all over <laughs> yeah. his body. Squeezed in. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, a, like a sausage <laughs> a and boily sausage a boily yeah. sausage that's his cousin <laughs> but yeah his look with the mask and everything it's really striking when you look at some of the concept art they had from originally they had some crazy ideas but what they did on the screen really good really memorable and that's what you want mm-hmm. from a bad guy yeah 
I wouldn't say Morton Joe was as iconic as a Joker or a Darth Vader, no. but he maybe could have been if we'd seen more of him or if we knew more about him. So yeah. to answer Pete's question, I'd say Joe is very good. Sits on the second tier in the Villain Hall of Fame for me alongside okay. characters like Norman Stansfield and Biff Tannen, people like that. Right. So what are you looking at, butthead? <laughs> Biff. <laughs> oh, Sean Biff. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh, Messi, what do you think of Joe? Is that why Biff crashed the car in the first film? <laughs> <laughs> I think, yes, I think he's a great, great bad guy because it's built on reputation, not exactly what mm. you see. So it's all a backstory, more or less. It's like everyone respects him, everyone's scared of him. So you are immediately. And I think that's a brilliant way to set up a bad guy really quickly when you need a really fast narrative and you really yeah. need a really fast development of character and when you see him when he walks out in that mask and everything it's just perfect costume design mm -hmm. even everything about him like the way he plays that the way it's, it's it's almost like yeah that makes sense like it's as ridiculous as it is that's probably how that guy should dress because that's the best he's gonna look mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> like, if he wears it he sticks a suit on or something he's gonna look like the penguin out of batman <laughs> return <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i think he's a really good bad guy but i think the reputation of that guy is built um through the through the other narratives through the other characters which makes him terrifying so the main cast members there then all very good mm -hmm. some great supporting characters yeah. and a good villain as well that's all you need indeed and that is part two we're still on the fury road though Come back for the third and final part where we talk about our highlights from the film and then rate the movie out of 10. It's going to be historic.